is a picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss. Today we're on episode seven of our series called A Passover Backstory. We've been going through a lot of information in the series and we've got a lot more to cover, so we're gonna jump right in. Oh my gosh, dinner rolls. We're gonna be excommunicated. Are Easter Bunny's kosher? Jesus Christ, who forgot the matzah? Wait a separate check, please. Cultures have been coming and going for millennia. Some perished through violent conquest. Others were extinguished due to internal collapse or natural disaster. What allows one society to thrive while another evaporates? How does one worldview overcome or figuratively disembowel another? I proposed one simple biblical example where accommodation almost led to assimilation. The ancient Shechemites tried to embrace and engulf the Jews. They failed quickly. The Babylonians famously tried to dominate and enslave the Jews. They failed slowly because we survived, but they didn't. The Nazis tried to conquer and destroy the Jews. They failed monumentally. But what about the Egyptians? We know that the Egyptians hated the Jews even before we were enslaved. As early as the time of Joseph, the Egyptian servants of Joseph refused to eat at the same table with Joseph's brothers, and I quote, because Egyptians despise Hebrews and refuse to eat with them. The tremendous success of Egypt's economy under Joseph's leadership may have amplified the divide between Jews and Egyptians. The Jews thrived during the time of Joseph's favor. They acquired property and they were fruitful, and their population grew rapidly, the Bible says. Making matters worse, the non-Jewish Egyptians became very poor during the lean years of Egypt's drought. Joseph was credited with transferring the financial wealth of Egyptian citizens into Pharaoh's treasure chest. Joseph also secured the vast landmass for Pharaoh that had become barren and unable to produce during Egypt's famine. The then recently impoverished peasant class of Egypt might have held their losses against Joseph and his family. I mean, he was simply doing his job, but he did it well to the detriment of the underclass of the Egyptians for the benefit of the king. Joseph was born to be the greatest mind in all of Egypt, and the children of Israel were called to enjoy their season of prosperity, just as the later generations were called to play their role in God's plan as slaves until in God's time, quote, they became too mighty for their enemies. Then he turned the Egyptians against the Israelites and they plotted against the Lord's servants. Now, I'm still not sure how Pharaoh enslaved the Jews of Egypt. He appears to have found a more productive less bloody method. Was any mass slaughter of Jews in Egypt recorded before they entered slavery? Were any reports from the Gentile realm of Egypt into the Jewish region of Egypt ever memorialized? Were any recollections of violent Jewish protests noted against the enslavement by the Egyptians? I am unaware of any such events. Now, it is known that Pharaoh feared a Jewish uprising because that was what led, to, led Pharaoh to later establish this barrier of slavery that kept the Jews from taking over through revolt. It also stopped them from assimilating through default. I know we were enslaved. The Bible is emphatic about this fact, but I don't know how. Some tragic reversal of fortunes transposed the wealthy Jews into slaves and enabled the robust economy of Egypt to thrive 
through both Jewish slave labor and some form of an Egyptian peasant class. But the Jews had been living the high life in Egypt until the time they were shoved to the lowest rung of society. How did this radical transformation happen? The process may have been akin to the old story of boiling a frog. The story goes that if a frog is placed in a pot of boiling water, the frog would immediately jump out of the pot. But if that same frog were placed in a pot of comfy, cozy water, it would have no reason to hop out. And if the water temperature were raised very, very slowly, the frog would eventually succumb and be boiled alive. Did we as Jews in Egypt succumb to Pharaoh like a frog? Were we enslaved by degrees? Was Pharaoh calculated like Hitler? Did Pharaoh legislate our rights away from the Jews one by one by what? Like Hitler did prior World War II. In Germany, the Jews had diligently worked to fit in. The totally successful assimilation of the Jews in Germany created a false sense of security for my people. We were solid citizens of Europe. We served in the German military. We were leaders in German society and business. We did not want trouble. We were always willing to accommodate. We wanted to be like everyone else. Through legislation, the growing Nazi party removed some of our rights peacefully. Later, more Nazi power led to more rights being stripped from the Jews by Hitler. His goons began to intimidate the Jews as their legal status deteriorated and Hitler's powers expanded so that by November of 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass brought the worst pogroms experienced by the Jews. Through religious bigotry, greed, violence, and a national propaganda campaign, the Nazis turned the entire nation against Germany's Jewish citizens. Passports, weapons, monies, properties, valuables of all sort were taken from the Jews by the Nazi-controlled government. They incapacitated the Jewish people in anticipation of the annihilation of the entire Jewish race. The norms of German society were changed by the power and influence of the Nazis. Hitler began his public service within a fringe political party, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. It was just a tiny minority of extreme nationalists and anti-Semites. Hitler's little lunatic fringe group evolved from the margins of German society. This vocal, organized minority of radical Aryans cunningly took over the conscience of the German nation, and the Nazis almost conquered the free world, while the Allies dismissed their obvious evil agenda. Didn't happen immediately. It happened in carefully orchestrated stages, just as a frog might remain in water slowly being brought to a boil. A measured cadence of change may have allowed the German population to accept the destruction of millions of Jews and other hated minorities. Perhaps hated minorities deserve our deeper consideration. Minority views, frog boils, and a Passover detour. These next brief comments may feel disjointed or perhaps even unwelcome in a discussion about Passover. So consider this my Passover detour. Uh, feel free to reflect on this at your leisure. If uh, your sensibilities cannot tolerate bigotry, racism, slavery, slaughter, or whispers of conspiracy. My people have experienced each of these despicable realities, and I'm perplexed with my own questions. Why were my people subjugated into slavery by the Egyptians? I don't understand how it happened. My people were also subjugated into slavery by the Nazis. My relatives were rounded up and branded with numbers like animals. Some of them were thrown into cattle cars and hauled off to slave labor gangs and death camps. It seems incredible that 
such atrocities could have happened in a modern civilized Christian society. Minorities have reason to be concerned when the majority accumulates too much power. What happens when a former majority view becomes relegated to a disenfranchised minority? Can such a thing happen? Could people who believe the Bible defines the rules about sexuality soon become an endangered minority? Said differently, are Bible-believing Christians and Jews at risk of becoming an unprotected, unwanted class of people? America was admittedly a Judeo-Christian country formed on biblical presuppositions. What was true at our founding and true through our flourishing may not remain true for our falling. If you think that was a lot, I celebrate Passover and have celebrated Passover every year since I was a small child. So I understand we're digging in deep here, uh, but stick with us. We've got more to come and I hope you enjoy it. Did you know that leprosy still exists? That's why a few years ago, we worked with World Missionary Evangelism to create a leper clinic here in India where we provide the medicines and food and the gospel on a daily basis. One thing we found was that the children of leper patients were contracting the disease as well because they get the disease through regular daily contact over long periods of time. So we worked with WME to create a children's home where the children of these leper patients could live nearby their family, but give them a hope and a future free of the disease. Would you consider sponsoring one of these children? Would you consider helping to give them a hope and a future? For just $25 a month, you can give that hope. You can provide that future. Less than a dollar a day. Give us a call at 1-800-688-3422. I hope you haven't forgot everything you learned before the break. We're going to jump right back in and there's a lot more to go. So I'm going to throw this back to my dad. America is rapidly becoming a post-Christian nation. If this trend continues, what will become of us? Are we relics of faith that no longer fit in the new America? Are we witnessing a fraud boil in America? Dare I ask if we are becoming acclimated to the social, political, and moral boiling coming our way? As people committed to the Bible, are we like the frog slowly being boiled in what was comfy, cozy water? For our purposes, I'm referring to people who love the God of Israel and believe the Bible to be God's word for mankind. Given the many flavors of social, religious, and political disagreement, it is reasonable to ask how minority views have quickly advanced into majority policies. For example, homosexuality was once considered immoral by nearly all citizens of America. Even homosexuals hid their conduct because it was understood to be aberrant behavior that brought shame to the individuals and disgust to society. People knew the Bible called such behavior an abomination. It was also obvious that homosexuality was abnormal when compared to the natural order of life and procreation. That was why it brought humiliation when homosexual behavior was discovered. In fact, sodomy was often illegal. Nevertheless, we all realize that homosexuality has morphed into a cause to bring change to social, religious and legislative policies. Some, well, they work for the day when an openly homosexual president will be elected. If that day comes, what becomes of our nation's foundation built on biblical morality? Homosexual activists are no longer satisfied coming out of the closet. Some want to lock vocal heterosexuals in the closet where disparate views can be silenced and some view the biblical language prohibiting homosexuality as hate speech. How did the moral sea change accelerate to the current damning degree? Perhaps the turning point could be identified by taking 
a look back to recall despicable early hate crimes against homosexuals from the last century. Some burly straight guys assaulted someone believed to be homosexual. Most sane people agree that nobody should harm, torment, or kill a homosexual person in modern society. That is excluding in Islamic nations where homosexuals are harmed, tormented, or killed according to Muslim law. Now, even though the Bible suggests some sexual sins are best managed through horribly harsh punishments, our culture rejects such treatment of fornicators, adulterers, or homosexuals, etc. Neanderthal gay bashers were the ones who set the stage for a movement to outlaw gay bashing. This was a rational response to irrational hate crimes. Homosexuals should be protected, just like all law-abiding citizens. We all deserve protection under the law. Homosexuality happened to be a minority problem, and even calling it a problem can now be considered inappropriate by some moderns. The vocal homosexual minority successfully advanced their minority views into becoming a policy issue to be embraced by a segment of the majority. In other words, straight people have taken on the cause of gay people. And who would argue with the premise that it is wrong to torture or kill a homosexual? The idea is abhorrent and barbaric. Such general agreement became a stepping stone for the minority to secure additional protections for their minority class. Each step on the path toward erasing inequality moved the minority closer to their goal of full equality. Sadly, not even Hollywood can convert a biblical abomination into a righteous cause. Homosexuality may be celebrated on screen, on stage, in art, and even in Congress, but God still condemns it. For clarity, I believe in equality before the law. I believe in tolerance. I believe people have the right to live as homosexuals. I believe homosexuals have the right to reject the Bible. I'm not intolerant. I, I simply reject the rhetoric of some homosexual activists who would demand that I support their behavior or call it normal. It must be abnormal, because that's the way the Bible deems an abomination. It's not normal. Of course, not everyone believes the Bible, so it is absurd to assume those who do not should be expected to follow the standards declared in a book they reject. However, it is also absurd that those who do reject the Bible should presume that the rest of us should abandon our biblical beliefs simply because it makes them uncomfortable. Comfort is not an inalienable right or an expectation guaranteed by our Constitution. Do the right things and you might find it. Do the wrong things and it will likely elude you. If a homosexual insists on being comfortable in a sinful habit, their comfort is best protected by not asking a Bible believer if it's okay to flaunt a sinful practice. If you want to remain comfortable, quit sinning. Or don't ask a person who believes the Bible for their opinion about sin. Homosexuals do not require our approval. Why should they demand our acceptance? Why can't we just agree to disagree about such things and be nice to each other in spite of our differences? Homosexuality has found its pathway to becoming mainstream. Supporters of homosexuality have successfully advocated for social, religious, and legislative policy changes advancing the cause of homosexuality across our nation and within numerous so-called Christian denominations. What was previously labeled simply as gay became a modern alliance known as LGBT. Soon, other sexual minorities opposed to biblical norms, teamed up to advance the cause of additional aberrations. As of this time, the abbreviated label has expanded to LGBTQQ1PS2A+. 
A. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. It was necessary to include smaller and smaller subsets of confused sexual oddities. If the perversions continue to expand, the abbreviations may soon require billboards instead of bumper stickers to support each new group seeking synergistic support for their behavior. Privately, do some of their leaders wonder which sexual deviants crossed the line and must be voted off the label? Is any perversion considered sinful or disgusting? Now, if you forgot what led to this rather odd rabbit trail, it was the proposal of ancient methods to conquer and enslave. I now believe things haven't changed that much. We're often asked to accommodate those who reject biblical norms. Accommodation should not lead to a fundamental acceptance of that which is morally unacceptable. Tolerance should not require a surrender of our biblical values. If tolerant desires to accommodate are confused with our requirement to remain distinct, we risk being swallowed through assimilation. Christians and Jews must remain vigilant to never assimilate and become lost to the distinctive call to live as God's chosen. There is a highly activist element among the anti-biblical minority who attempt to incapacitate those who support and promote biblical norms because it makes them feel uncomfortable. Christians should not make sinners uncomfortable. Eventually, sin will make a sinner more uncomfortable than we are capable. When a sinner finally regrets his or her sin, we should invite them to encounter our Messiah. We should invite the Spirit of God to address the sin problem. We should expect God to convict, to convince, and to connect the sinner to the Savior. We must love and point people to God. If we simply let God be God, He will. Meanwhile, if any unrepentant sinners are reading this or hearing my voice, my advice is to avoid getting too comfy, too cozy, too at ease with your sin. Guilt and shame are proper responses to ungodly behavior. It should lead to repentance, not social upheaval. Believers must retain their right to remain intractably committed to the moral standards demanded in Scripture. And if we hold to biblical truths, we might be misunderstood. We may face rejection in a changing culture. This should not be a surprise. The foundational status of the Bible itself is under attack. Some believers have already felt the fury with which the anti-biblical minority has tried to intimidate believers. There is an overt intent to change laws, change norms, change entertainment standards, and change government policies to undermine biblical norms of morality. Where the precepts of the Bible become obstacles, to the unfettered pursuit of immoral choices, an anti-biblical minority is working to remove the Bible's influence and promote unbiblical lifestyle choices. Now, don't get me wrong. I absolutely, in no way, I am not saying gay people want to dominate everyone. And neither am I saying gay people want everyone to be gay. I do believe some want our society to validate their gay lifestyle choices. However, to grant that validation in light of biblical standards is to contradict the foundational beliefs of sexuality presented in the Bible. Therefore, I reject any radical gay agenda that presumes to go beyond raising a rainbow flag or shining rainbow lights on the outside of the White House. And I hope they fail to influence legislation from inside the White House. If such minority causes succeed in becoming majority expectations, those of us who kindly tolerate such behavior in a free country may find ourselves subject to a new form of discrimination in a country with less freedom. If our desire to honor God and promote the Bible is eventually deemed to be intolerant, we may find our norms to be unwelcome, unacceptable, or God forbid, unlawful. The current trend 
toward eradicating the obvious distinctions between male and female has elevated our society's race toward gender confusion. Erasing gender-specific language cannot change the way God created men and women, but it can create division and dissent between those who believe the Bible and those who reject its influence. When the censors of society are given the right to decide what is fit for consumption by a society, that society is no longer truly free. Rather, it is subject to the arbiters of our freedom. When the Bible becomes hate speech, faith in the Bible becomes dangerous. Even the content of this simple discussion could become classified into something it was never intended to be. Anyone could be censored when opinions based on biblical standards become unwelcome. It is now recognized that no one is free from censorship. Even a sitting president of the United States was not immune from being silenced by social media. So no one is quite sure who should control the reins of censorship, but nobody wants to be the one who is censored. This detour presented concerns about people and nations becoming desensitized to sin. Well, as the Bible loses influence, the culture's moral compass becomes untrustworthy. When a people are led by immoral adjudicators who can no longer recognize the difference between boys and girls, how can such a people be expected to, to determine right from wrong in the affairs of government? Such a, a lack of good judgment now appears to be common. Such confusion is now heralded as being forward-thinking and respectable. The ancient Hebrew prophet Isaiah warned, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. You see, such descriptions seem to mirror our nation's Congress, some of its courtrooms, and much of its media. These are symptoms of a sin-sick society in need of repentance, forgiveness, and atonement. We all need mercy. Without it, we will face God's wrath. None of us are perfect. We, we've all sinned. We've all, therefore, also earned judgment. My judgment is that this detour about minorities must end, and our future as believers in America must progress toward active faith and vibrant practice. Thereby, we can best protect our rights by exercising them and working toward revival in our land. Today, we can still celebrate as God instructs. Well, I hope you got a lot out of today's episode. There's a lot more where that comes from. Again, check us out online, crosstalk.org. You can download a free copy of uh, a PDF download of the book, Passover Backstory, at randyweiss.com. And of course, watch all the episodes at crosstalk.org. Until next time, shalom and God bless.